I was desperate, you know, at the time I was 17, 18, unemployed, you know, and I was desperate to, you know, to get a break. And I knew that if I did get a try, I would, you know, I would grab the chance. I think it was always going to be boxing. I mean, I stepped into the gym as a 10 or 11 year old. Boxing just took hold of my heart straight away. I love everything about the sport of boxing. Hello, I'm Marie Crow, and this is We Become Heroes, the RT Sport podcast that explores how elite athletes and sports people reach the top of their game and the lessons that they learned along the way. I'm delighted to say that my guest today is All Ireland winning Armagh footballer Oisin McConville. Oisin, how are you? Marie, how's fun? Yeah, well, good. How's life with you? It's good, Marie. It's it's busy. Um, I know you're in the same boat with uh, the taxi service. With- we, you know, as far as you know, getting kids to and from all their different activities, um, and I suppose you put that in along with a bit of work, a bit of school work, and uh, and then I'm obviously managing the team myself, doing a bit of coaching, and so it's busy. It is busy. Like I mean, I think a lot of times when it gets to this time of year, people just start crying out for Christmas just to get two weeks, two weeks, two weeks to themselves. But look, it is it is enjoyable and uh, it's busy, but it is enjoyable. You know? So Tyrone are the All Ireland football champions. How do you feel about that? Absolutely, got it, Marie. Um, <laughs> but I suppose uh, from a normal point of view, there uh, there ain't much worse scenarios than Tyrone becoming All Ireland champions. But uh, I said after the semi-final, I had a begrudging respect for what Tyrone had done, but I would have huge respect for what they've done now. Um, and I think when you think of uh, Fergal Logan, Logan and Brian Dua and how much they have been able to learn in one year, um, how they've been able to change things up. Like, they didn't change... It's not that they changed things up dramatically, they just put a bit of faith in a few lads who maybe have been in and out of that, that team on the Mickey Hart. Uh, change things up from game to game, to be honest. You know, were, I thought were quite flexible. Not quite Claudio Ranieri sort of uh, Tinkerman stuff, but they definitely uh, they definitely changed things up a little bit as they went through it. And they tried out different scenarios and, and, and found a, a way to mix. And they just looked as if they were a team playing with confidence and a bit of freedom and all those sort of things. And I know, you know, when you're winning, it's easy to look as if you're playing with freedom and stuff. But I just thought they put faith in the likes of McCurry and that. And I think that faith was rewarded. Do you think the template is there now for other teams if they do want to try and emulate them? Like it does sound like they made something that seemed almost insurmountable and complex pretty simple. Yeah, uh, I don't want to um, build them up and then to take a little bit away from them, but definitely if you consider uh, where Jerome were at the start of the year, I think there's a lot of teams who would have felt that they were on, they were on a pretty level playing field. Anybody who watched the mini Ulster Challenger, which was uh, one half of the Division One. You will see that all of those teams were very, very competitive with each other, like Armagh, Monaghan, Donegal. There wasn't a lot between them, and we've seen that in all those games. Um, so I think it'll give a lot of teams heart, the fact that Tron were able to um, put, put a run together and win the championship. I think it becomes more difficult when the format changes, but uh, definitely, as far as template is concerned, yes. But also, as far as you know, hope for the for the teams that we thought maybe were at the next tier on the maybe the Kerrys and the and the Dublins. We have a special congress just around the corner, and potentially we could see a very different football championship coming down the track. A lot of the players and the GPA have come out and said that they would like to see a proposal B coming in, and it would be like a league-based championship in the summer. What are your thoughts on uh, changing the way things are? Uh, to be honest, Maria, I'm, uh, in the last week, I've got more worried because uh, there seems to be this thing where you know we we've we've convinced ourselves that that it's not as broken as we thought it was three or four months ago, um, and that worries me because I think we need wholesale changes. Um, I think you know now's the time to uh, to do something drastic. I think now's the time to like when people talk about uh, what sort of change we need. I think we need wholesale changes. I think we need a junior and intermediate and a senior competition. I don't think that's going to happen. 
but if we can get two tiers in uh, first and foremost, and I do understand, you know, where weaker counties are coming from as regards, you know, they're going to get, you know, they're going to just drift away from from all the aspirations they had, but. Like we we got to be realistic about the thing and, and realize that there's a lot of teams that won't be competing for Sam Maguire for for a, a long time. We need to give them the benefit of more games, and I think the the league based system is the, is probably the way to do that. Um, I think you know we, we we're crying out now. A lot of teams are crying out now for a full league program. Uh, and as many championship matches as they can possibly fit in. And I think that's the only way the teams will improve, but also find out exactly where they are. Um, and I think, you know, that that intermediate uh, championship or second tier championship, whatever way you want to call it, uh, I think it can be a success <clears throat> because I think uh, lads definitely are getting ahead around the fact that, you know, Sam Maguire is probably, probably for most teams uh, dramatically out of reach um, and I think you don't have to go to Division 4 to realise that you know that's that's the case in, in for some of the Division 2 teams but I think two tiers gives other teams a, a realistic chance of having a run to build in something to build in some momentum and then when you do that I think there's an opportunity for improvement there have been some dissenting voices coming out of Ulster, though, because of the changes to the provincial system. And there's a feeling that the Ulster Championship will lose its meaning and, you know, I suppose essentially just diminish in value. What are your thoughts on that as, as somebody that would have um, played football in the Ulster Championship? I love the Ulster Championship, Marie. Um, I think it, it consistently has delivered over the last... Uh, 20 years when some of the other um, championships, um, the Leinster Championship and the Munster Championship have have, uh, have been nothing championships really. Um, but I do think that there has to be a sacrificial lamb somewhere along the way. I think if the Ulster Championship has to be that, then I think for the greater good of, of what's happening, I think we all need to suck that up and just say, you know, we'll... Uh, even if it's, if, if, if it's a proposal that we give, you know, three years to you know, similarly to the way we did with the with the Super 8s. Uh, but I think, you know, if the Ulster Championship has to go, then it has to go. Because, as I say, you know, they're going to have to be... Um, somebody's going to have to bend the knee a little bit in order for all of this to work. And I think uh, provincial councils, you know, are right at the, at, the, at the top of that. And again, you know, first have a special congress and now to be realistically in a position where... You know, change doesn't seem as obvious as it did three months ago. I mean, we had Larry McCarthy on uh, on BBC one day, and and uh, like change, as far as we were concerned, after the conversation, you know, change was definitive and it was going to happen. Uh, some of the moments over the last couple of weeks um, just uh, wouldn't fill you full of confidence that that was actually going to be the case. But look at it. It needs wholesale change, and I think um, now's the time to do it. I think people, in particular players and uh, and and county boards, are more open to it than than they ever have been. But um, it's a wait and see sort of thing, and uh, and I hope we don't blink at the last minute and and uh, and don't offer the change to players and and, and spectators that that they deserve. Well, that is going to happen very, very soon. So it will be interesting to see how it plays out. Right, we are going to take you down um, memory lane now and go through some of your career highs and um, your your main memories. So I'm going to start with what your earliest memory of sport is. Um, my earliest memory of sport is uh, being on the football pitch um, across, I lived about a hundred yards away from the football pitch, so I just had to cross the road and I was straight into into the pitch. We only had one pitch at the time. Um, it wasn't. It's fair to say it wasn't a car, but or anything like that. There, it wasn't maybe of the of the standard the pitches are now. But I just, I just love being in in that surroundings. Uh, you know, the, the helicopter would uh would would fly over over our heads and and. Initially, as a three or four year old, you know, you're looking up, and maybe a month later, it's of no consequence to you because you're that 
you know, that ingrained in, in what's happening in the football pitch. Uh, I was um, mascot for one of the um, early uh, crossing line winning championship teams in 1984, 85. It, maybe actually 83, which would have left me about seven or eight years of age. Um, I remember being on the side lane. I remember, you know, this winter green played a, a huge part in, in, in pre-match and those things. I just remember just that, that's all I could smell was, was, was winter green was just absolutely everywhere. Um, and deep heat and all those sort of things. But I just remember that, um, when I, when I sat there and I watched that game, I felt as if I could play in it. I felt as if I wanted to play in it and I had a right to play in it. And uh, I suppose at that stage, I already said about trying to emulate some of the people that I was watching. I had two brothers who played on, on that team. And, you know, I remember carrying one of the bags to the, to the match that day. And, and it just being a pretty big occasion. And, and as I say, wanting to emulate and wanting to, um, just wanting to win championships across. First of all, just trying to get a game, I suppose. Um, and trying to get on that, trying to get on that team because uh, when you're when you're that age you have huge aspirations but also you'd be thinking right let's take this one step at a time here let's let's you know let's uh, walk before we can run so but I just wanted to I just wanted to be part of all of that because because in our town there was nothing else yeah. literally was nothing else as far as sport goes so who were your heroes then uh I definitely early on was uh, my brother Jim he played corner forward for Cross he played corner forward for Armagh I mean a lot of my early years um, were spent watching him you know going to games we took in uh, a championship match here there and everywhere uh, we got the opportunity to see you know uh, guys that you would very rarely even get the opportunity to see on TV. I mean, you know, the coverage was nothing like it was, like it is now. Um, so you, to see to get the opportunity to go and see him playing in a in a, in a championship match and and thing, and it would be not it wouldn't be strange for us in in, in my house at that time to to take in four or five, maybe even six championship matches in one weekend. That would be Monon Championship, Armagh Championship, Loud Championship. I mean, down championship. We literally, you know, we went everywhere. Our lives revolved around that. So, um, my early sporting heroes, as far as um, GA was concerned, was probably my brother Jim. Um, I I would have loved that me team as well. Um, around the mid eighties, nineties, uh, um, Flynn O'Rourke, uh, Stafford. Uh, I always wanted to be a free taker. I. I I was taking free kicks off the ground at six and seven years of age. So, um, you know, anybody who took free kicks, Barney Rock. Um, I know Morris Fitz doesn't like, doesn't like me saying this, but but he was certainly one of them as I, as I grew up. Also, even though there's not that much difference as far as the age is concerned, but he was definitely playing on a bigger, on a much bigger stage than I was at, a, at an earlier age, if you know what I mean. And, and he was the, some of the guys that I was watching. And even though... I went to school in, uh, in Down and they tortured us because they had obviously more all Ireland's than, than we had. Um, even some of those Down players, McCartan and Lyndon and, you know, uh, Greg Blaney. There's so many. There was so many, but I suppose closer to home, my brother was the one who sort of who made sure I was I was going to drive on and try and... Uh, and I never thought, actually, because of the age gap, that I would get have the opportunity to play him with him. But we actually went on and, and won an All-Ireland together. Just actually three brothers in the first cross team. So that makes it very, very special as well. Yeah, must have done. Were there other sports, though, that you were interested in, that you played, that you watched? Um, my dad, let's just say my dad wasn't a soccer fan. Um... But we, we watched it behind his back, uh, you know, if we, if we left the house or, or that. Uh, I was a United fan um, from a very early age. Uh, Robson, Clare, uh, that Bruce Pallister here, all, all, them, all them lads. I mean, uh, that was an unbelievable time to be watching United. I mean, there was so many... So many years of pain, but I was lucky enough. I didn't. I didn't have all those years. Um, 
but yeah, them and as far as sports concerned, uh, my brother uh, Jim was in he, uh, when he was quite young. He went to America to um, play a bit of football and walk over there during the summer. He ended up staying probably maybe a year or two. Uh, but when he came home, he brought he brought me home a load of Philadelphia Eagles. He was in Philadelphia and he brought me home a load of Philadelphia Eagles stuff, and that got me started on uh, that got me started on on NFL. And I've followed them since. And uh, I've some nightmare houses now. Even the kids are, I have the kids taught them, we're trying to get through the rules and stuff of it. But, uh, and unbelievably, cricket as well. Uh, I, I watch uh, a good bit of cricket as well. I was introduced, to, Jim introduced me to that as well because he used to watch the test stuff. Like, <laughs> I couldn't watch the test stuff now, but um, I, I love I love the cricket. I would, have a, I would have a keen interest, you know, Indian Premier League or Big Bash, any of that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, all sports. And believe it or not, we had. Uh, I remember t- we bought uh, stumps and, and cricket bats and, and balls, and we took it over to the pitch. And like, if anybody had seen us in cross playing cricket in the in the eighties and nineties, Marie, we would be. We definitely would have been chased out of town, but uh, yeah, it was uh, any sport whatsoever. And then um, so many people just have a bit of an influence on you. You know, Michael Jordan was obviously, you know, going well, you know, at that stage. And just, look, as I say, I sort of, we sort of latched on. We, I remember uh, we, we, the kids, come up with this plan as, as soon as uh, Sky uh, launched. Um, we come up with this plan that we would get him, we'd get my father that for his birthday, <laughs> even though it was, it was more or less for ourselves. But uh, once we get into that, that just put it on to a completely different level. I mean, it was, it was sport 24 7. I mean, I had no interest in school whatsoever. I just, just wanted to play sport, didn't matter what it was. So, when did you realize you had a talent for sport then? Um, I don't know whether I was hoodwinked into thinking that I had talent or what, but I just remember we had a coach called Tim Gregory and he, he basically took us under 10s, 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s. I don't know how the man, now that I look, I don't know how the man done it, but he was looking after most age groups in the in the club. He was a phenomenal coach. But i tell you what he was. He was a sports psychologist before we knew anything about sports psychologists. Um, he used to call me the maestro. Uh, from a very early age and and uh, I wasn't sure if, if behind me back he was calling other people the maestro but as far as I was concerned when he said that that's who I was we used to do this little winter league um, and he had me captain and, and uh, my team was called the maestros and there was there was different teams and, uh, and as I say that sort of stuck with me give me an awful amount of confidence as I say even though I, I, I don't know what what substance was behind that but uh, I suppose it got to my last year in primary school, and I realised that that I, I was I was going pretty well, and that uh, I suppose I had developed um, right foot, left foot, and I, I played. I was playing against a lot of lads who didn't have that, and uh, and I thought it was I had a step on them already. And when I got into secondary school, I hated I hated that in academic academic. Uh, I wasn't great academically and I suppose the only thing that sort of kept me going in school was the fact that, you know, it was PE, you know, we PE twice a week and, and we basically got after school football every day of the week because when I first went in, I was playing first year football, second year football and third year football. So um, I sort of had a fair idea by the time I got to 12, 13, 14 that uh, I definitely had a talent for it. I didn't have the build for it, but I had the talent for it. Do you think that it was a natural talent? I know there's a lot of arguments about whether that's even a thing or was it just that you worked hard at it, just out all the time, playing, playing, playing? Yeah, and it wasn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I don't know if it was a natural talent. I think uh, a lot of the stuff that I did probably developed over time, but I, I never seen it as, you know, working on things, even sort of in my later career. I never seen it so much as working on things as far as, what was happening on the pitch, all that sort of stuff, just it did come naturally to me. But uh, physically, I had, I, uh, that's where I had to walk hard. And uh, and like, I don't know if I would get away with playing the way I was then. I don't know if I would get away with playing 
do you know I'd like to think I would but uh, definitely you know I was training harder at 31 32 years of age than I'd ever trained before I was training every single day of the week just so physically I could I could live with the demands of and that was like even at 33 I, I stopped playing inter-county football and uh, and like I would say the next five or six years that I played club football I was in better shape than I was when I was playing into county football so I had to work physically I had a lot of work to do physically I mean the first game I played was a division three game I think we played Leitrim uh, in the athletic grounds uh, I think I scored in 2-4 2-5 um, I remember coming off the pitch thinking it's probably not going to be as easy next time we played Clare the next, uh, our next home game was Clare and I remember a guy called, I think his name was Seamus Clancy, uh, who played with Clare and I remember him letting me know that this was inter-county football very early on and I say I probably was 10, 10 and a half stone maybe. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. And, and, I know Seamus uh, Clancy, he would have completely yeah. eaten you yeah, for breakfast, lunch and Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he, he was, won it all star for Clare. Yeah, he was an exper- He was so experienced, even you know, at that time. Uh, but I just thought he was so physical. Yeah. And uh, and he was. I you know, I don't know. Like, there wouldn't have been a huge amount of video analysis. But even if you read a, a report from the Leitrim game, you would have realised that I was doing a bit of damage, and uh, he wasn't going to let that happen. Not in his watch. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, as I say, ten, ten and a half stone. I mean, I just wasn't ready for it. You know what I mean, but uh, but it was a good it was a good uh, wake up call for me. All of those experiences I had in Division Three that year, we played Division Two football the following year, and it just got, you know, it it started to ramp up a bit. But if I'm honest, uh, it's it, Division Two football wasn't as scary as Division Three because uh, you literally you would get away with they would get away with decapitating somebody in Division Three at that time. You know yeah. what I mean? It was it was tough. It was tough stuff on the pitches. It was winter football. It was either side of Christmas. It was, yeah, it was pretty unforgiving, but it was probably a good enough baptism uh, for what was to come down the line, you know? So if your physical attributes were what you were working on um, most, like, what did you do? Did you start going to the gym? Did you, you know, pull tires? Did you lift weights? No, uh, we, we, we trained. We, 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 I got to the stage um, at senior level where... We were definitely training in a very old school way. Maybe it wasn't that old school at the time, but uh, we used to do we used to do like 20, 30 minute runs around the field, but we used to carry bricks in, e- in either hand. And uh, we used to do that sort of thing. We used to have to hold them out uh, on both sides, small circles, big circles. I mean, everybody around that era has done all that stuff. And honestly, uh, as ridiculous as it sounds, it definitely was 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 uh, it definitely was it was making me uh, a lot more physical. Even though the weight was the one thing that wasn't particularly increasing, and I was like, I was eating, I was eating there out of the house and home, but I just I just couldn't. Uh, I had so much I had so much energy as as a young lad playing football that you know. Um, that I was just burning it off so much, and like even if we had a night off, like no, I would be over in the field and be kicking about, you know. And uh, I was just, I was eating, but I was burning it up. So I mean, I was, I felt as if I was, I if I was a lot more physical. I was able to raid the tackles a little bit more, but I wasn't, I wasn't getting any heavier, and that's sort of what I was trying to do. And it's very frustrating if you're trying to do that and it's just not happening for you. So no, no. <laughs> I, I want to go back there and I want to put it in reverse. Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, a lot of people in that boat. A lot of people can relate to that. Um, so, was there a moment then? Like, was there like you're obviously you're playing and you're young and you're playing well and you're making an impact. But you know, at some stage, was there kind of one of those moments where you went, "Yeah, I belong here. I can make it here at the top level of Gaelic football." Uh, probably started, if I'm honest, at club level. Um, by the time I was like my first three years at club level were were stuff of nightmares. Um, I was taken on as a 16 year old uh, for a free taker at senior level, and we got a free kick, and I, and I missed the free kick, and we ended up getting put out of the championship. The following year, um, we were. 10-0 down against uh, Pierce Oaks and Katie 
um, in the first round of the championship and we clawed our way back to two points and we got a penalty and I was 17 and for some reason I was handed the ball and uh, I missed the penalty not the first one I would miss in my career but uh, we were put out of the championship the following year uh, BBC did a documentary called More Than a Game with ourselves in a neighbouring club Mullaban and we ended up getting beaten out and uh, I thought this is just not going to happen for me and uh, and then the following year we won our first championship um, uh, and and from that it sort of started to flow I felt confident the confidence was was brimming and then just once I get into the county squad uh, I played my first championship match at 20 and uh, I scored 8 points but I had I would describe it as a bit of a nightmare if you know what I mean um, and then probably from that from that stage on, uh, just things started all going in, in the one direction. Uh, you know, it's kicking 10, 12, 15 points a game and some, you know, in, in league games and that was giving me confidence going into the championship and then uh, it was really starting to happen for me at, uh, at inter-county level. Probably, um, like, 1999, got 2-7 in an Ulster final and uh, that was probably, it's was probably one, a game that sort of uh, give me just that, just put me on to that next level and give me that next step where I thought, you know, there's, there's a lot, that's good, but there's there's a lot more in me. And uh, but that was as complete performance, I suppose, as, as I had as an inter county level. You mentioned the word confidence quite a few times already in this interview. Did you always have it? Did you work on it? What did you do when it was not? Uh, Marie, even when my I I, exu- I always wanted to exude a confidence, and and then I would have got the stage where I had a, a couple of times where I had a crisis of confidence, uh, but I also but I always still exuded the confidence. If that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. I had other stuff going on in the background of my life, which um, which meant that what you seen was not what you were getting, and uh, so I. In 1989, you know, I was, I had, uh, I wore my collar up. Uh, I think I was the only player um, in Ireland who was probably doing that. And the reason for that was that my confidence was in my ankles, if I was, if I was honest. Uh, and things going on behind the scenes were not helping. Um, but, uh, but I couldn't let people see that. And I couldn't let, you know, the players I was playing against see that. As far as they were concerned, they were playing against a cocky, arrogant so-and-so. And that's the, that's the image I wanted to portray. And uh, that's the way I, I, I went about things. And I was clear in my mind that the best way to do that was stick a collar up. Um, I did get a pair of, of white boots, but uh, I wore them at trail one night and cross And when I come back out of the shower, they were ripped to shreds. Uh, because that just wasn't a done thing. That was it was ego t- egotistical, and and we had this thing across where nobody got ahead of themselves, and that was why in that change room we ended up being as successful as we were. If you are getting it above your station, you're absolutely ripped to shreds. But I wasn't just ripped to shreds; my boots were as well. So if I could have at that time, I would have been wearing white boots and had the collar on. <laughs> Now, that wouldn't seem that strange now, but... Uh, and crumbling inside. Yeah, yeah, but I remember Brian McLennan coming coming to me after, I think it was 19 or 2000, he said, one thing we can't believe you'll not be doing next year, and that's wearing your collar up. And I said, Brian, I'll, wear, I'll do whatever I want. I'll wear my collar up. And uh, he walked in at the start of the new season, he says, everybody, actually, this is our new jersey, and there's no collar on it. <laughs> and he, he come to me and he says and you know why it's no colour on it and I said why it's because because of you <laughs> well that shows so, you there's plenty of ways to skin a cat really yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> so look what about setbacks like I, it must be very hard to kind of nearly separate what happens on the field to what happens off the field when they are so interconnected Really, but what would you classify as the biggest setback that you had in your career? Uh, well, if you're thinking of, uh, of first of all, off the field, I mean, it was like a constant setback. Uh, like I was, I was living, you know, two lives. I was living, I was, 
I was addicted to gambling off the field and and uh, I was finding very difficult to reconcile both things. Uh, and the only way I could do it was to um, try and separate them completely as in, um, as in like, as soon as I got out of the car, walked into the change rooms, I felt a bit of freedom. And that's what sport gave me and that was what football gave me. It sort of gave me a sanctuary. Um, and like the setbacks on the pitch as far as losing games and, st and stuff, uh, I had to put those in context because my life was falling apart off the pitch. And, uh, and, uh, and even some of the games, I suppose, early on, definitely, that we were getting beaten, uh, I had to put those in perspective and say, listen, you know, it's given me the opportunity to get into a change rooms. Uh, I've said this numerous times, it sounds dramatic, but at that time it was sort of keeping me alive. Um, you know, having that one thing in my life to give me that little bit of discipline and focus. Um, and I think that the, 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 the losing the games on the field, I mean, like, if you were part of that Amas squad at that time, the setbacks, as I say, were pretty constant. I mean, we could have won a, uh, you know, we definitely could have won an All Ireland in '89, right being right. 2000, we weren't that far away. 2001, in all of those years, we ended up getting beaten by the eventual All Ireland champion champions, and we were beat by a point in all those games. Um, and you know, the, so the setbacks were continuous. But look, nobody plays sport without setbacks, and and you have to use those those setbacks and use them as as something that can drive you on. I mean, like. You know, like losing hurts more now than it, than it ever has for me because when I lost during the years that I was playing, um, as I say, I had to put them in context with the other crap that was going on behind the scenes. Whereas now, like you know, as a, even as a manager, like I I dwell on things, you know what I mean, and and, and dwell on things and run them and play them over my head over and over again. And uh, it sort of lit this, I find sport a little bit unforgiving in that respect. Whereas when you were playing, there was always another game. You know, you you you, you get yourself up and you get on with it. And as I say, I was thankful that even just that I that I had the ability, or not the ability, but the capacity to go and and play in these games. And sort of as I say, I just sort of try and keep try to keep things in perspective. But in but like you talk about confidence, 1980, 2000, 2001. I mean. You know, we were getting, like, if you think of Mayo, I mean, like, we were probably the Mayo of that era in that, you know, we were getting constant setbacks and, and we were struggling and ready to bounce back from them. When you think of your whole career, who had the biggest impact on you? Wow. Um, I'd say definitely my mum had the biggest impact on, on my career in that she was a constant through it, throughout it all. Um, I think uh, was Joe Kernan like I I played under Joe Kernan for the vast majority of my club and county career if you consider them mm -hmm. running in tandem side by side so I mean he had, he had a huge influence um, even though a lot of the time he just let me get on with what, what I was doing if you know what I mean and mm -hmm. I think you know, when I look back, that's probably the best way that was probably the best way to deal with me I, I don't think it was particularly difficult to manage uh, as, as such, you might say different, but I don't think it was particularly dif difficult to manage. I didn't challenge things. Mm. Uh, I always felt as it, I always felt I had faith in what he was doing and what the people around him was doing, and I tried to conform as much as I could, as much as my own mind would let me. Um, and then I wasn't a, like because of what was going on off the pitch. I wasn't a confrontational character. You know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't confronting people or anything like that because um, I didn't have the confidence to do that. But um, I suppose Joe had a huge influence on my career in that. Uh, I remember going to a, a league match in, uh, you know, very, very early on in Joe's tenure. So, you know, I was probably, you know, I might have been 19, 20 at the time. And I'd never been, I'd never been taken off in my life, never. Never been taken off. And he took me off at half time of a league match in Armagh one day. And honestly, I can I can just look back and that pinpoint and think that's never going to happen to me again. And uh, 
I don't even know if it was playing that badly, but it, it was obviously the opportunity to um, to teach me a lesson, and I, I t- was taught a big lesson. So probably between my mum, who, as I say, was a constant. I mean, I have, I have a, a we have a, a, we won a schools competition. With, talking way back, we're talking eighty four, eighty five, something like that. It was final year of primary school, and like. You know, she's in them, she's practically in the middle of the pitch running up and then sailing with a bottle of water in her hand. Just, and she wasn't just trying to drive me on, she was trying to drive everybody on. And like after that, as I say, she was a constant because I spent a lot of um, my, I suppose, the peak of my career, you know, living at home. And it was just two of us, you know, with my father died in 89. And it was just two of us. And uh, and she would have, she, she would have, even though she thought I wasn't listening, she would have taught me a lot. Because like a lot of times when I was younger, I suppose I was I was pretty argumentative when it came to referees and uh, uh, opposition players and different things like that. And she used to just say the same thing as me uh, going out the door, just say nothing to nobody and just get on with it and hurt them on the scoreboard. And... <laughs> And um, definitely, even though, as I say, she thought a lot of times I was just going in one ear and out the other, it wasn't. You know, I was listening. Is there a performance from your career that you look back on and, <clears throat> and think, right, that, that's the performance that defines me? That's the one where I was in the flow state and everything went right? Well, I put 99 in the Ulster final against Down is, is, is definitely one of them. Um, and probably the All Ireland club final. Uh, two thousand. Uh, I think I, I wouldn't. I've never done the the stats on the many touches I had in that game, but like I seem to be on the ball every every minute or whatever it was. So, um, I think that one. Uh, those two games, ninety nine and two thousand. Um, there was a couple of later games which I was particularly proud of because it was like thirty five and thirty six years of age and still felt as if I was uh, as if I was doing it, but. Uh, complete performances, I think, both of those games. Uh, so one for the club and one for the one for the county. Nineteen eighty against Down and two thousand against Nafina in the in the club final. And it's always nice when you're doing it in the final. You know what I mean? Like you know, we we always would have said, let let's get to the final, let's get to a final, and then we can express ourselves. And at that stage, we were on an unbelievable run, especially with the club. Like we think we played. In the end, we ended up playing 24 or 5 finals and I don't think we'd be beating any until right up until 2009. So, um, yeah, they're probably those two games are the ones I'd be most proud of. And what about success then, when you think of everything and you've won quite a lot? What's your greatest success? Um, look, at it. 2002 for a county like Armagh, um, I mean, you know, we're still talking about it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and 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 to be honest, we would love for for the next generation to to um to have their moment in the sun now, I think. Um but we talk about two thousand and two like it was three years ago. Um so that's a bit special. But for me personally, two thousand and seven I was captain of the club team. I was after uh, going through rehab for for a gambling addiction and I come out the old shade and I don't think anybody would have trusted me to captain the team. Um before that, and uh, I was I was I was given captaincy that year, and um, we just had an unbelievable year as far as just what we experienced, how we went about it, uh, the the fun we had, and just how well we played. I mean, we were, we were phenomenal that year. We we didn't play that well in the in the final on on, uh, on Paddy's day. We only ended up drawing, but we we won the replay in Port Leash and, and I say that was probably the proudest moment because as, as I say, I've said this before, but it sounded like we're, it felt sorry like redemption for me that all of the stuff that had gone on in the past and also the aftermath that I could enjoy it. I didn't have to go away on my own, you know, slope mm-hmm. into a corner and and spend the day back in horses or whatever it was. Uh, I was just enjoying it. I was enjoying it with all the people around me. And it was fulfilling experience. It was a full, you know, I experienced everything about winning and all of those sort of things. Whereas I never, that had never happened to me before. Not even in 2002. I didn't have the opportunity to sit back and enjoy it or whatever it was. But uh, 2007 for me, from, for selfish reasons. And what about your legacy? What do you think it'll be? 
Jesus. I never thought really not much about legacy, but um, I think somebody who combine uh, combine club and, and county and was able to give everything to both. And I suppose um, somebody who just developed as a player and uh, I, had so much, I, I, I felt that I had a couple of different strands to my game because when I started out, I was... I was just, I felt as if I was just, I was a corner forward and it just was my job to get scores and take frees. And then I realised there was a lot more to to what I could achieve uh, from my own game than, I think, if you're talking about legacy, you don't think you'd be able to write all that stuff in a headstone. But um, <laughs> I suppose as far as legacy is concerned is that, you know, um, I won the ultimate battle in the end. You know what I mean? With myself off the pitch, and 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 then I was able to <clears throat> prosper on the pitch. It's a good one, I like that one. Um, so, what about what's next for you then? Well, um, I've managed my club um, <laughs> at senior level. Uh, I feel as if we were successful. We won two county championships, and we won an Ulster championship. Uh, that's probably not going to get us much in the role of honour up here. It was myself and John Mack or, or management. Uh, I've been uh, managing DKT for now on 10 years now. Um, I've enjoyed that. All of those experiences have given me um, a year and maybe to go a little bit further as far as uh, management's concerned. Uh, I was with Sensestown in, in Meath for uh, two years. Um, with uh, a club in and in a scheme now. Um, and it's tough. T- I find it a tough, tough experience as far as um, Monon, Monon football is, is, uh, is of a very high standard and you come up against teams who are set up differently all the time. And I think this is the greatest experience I could have got as far as management is concerned. It's tough, but it's, it's a great experience. I'm enjoying it. Um, I just feel as if I have more to offer as far as management is concerned. I just don't know if time, I just don't know if I'm going to have, you know, it's tough for three kids. You know, they've got their own things. I don't, I, I'm trying not to miss anything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes that's impossible. But, uh, but yeah, management is something that I like. And I think uh, probably as far as the next step is concerned for me, um, probably will be into county management at some stage. Okay, that's on the horizon then, I'd say, at some stage as well. Um, Oisin, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for sharing everything that you did over the years off the field as well, because I know you helped so many people um, along the way. And thanks for everything on the pitch. I'm sure the people of Arma and football fans around the country will be grateful for all those days of uh, the collar up that you gave them. As well. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks everybody for listening and watching. Please like, subscribe and leave a review.